So first of all, welcome. Uh, and thank you for making time for us at the end of possible. It's been quite a long day for many of you, so we, we really do appreciate it. Um, and we're here to talk about crunch time. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction about why we're talking about crunch time before handing over to these fine gentlemen. So in terms of why crunch time, I suppose it's fair to say if we look across most industries at the moment, we're seeing huge amounts of workforce transformation, uh, organisational development, redevelopment, and the pace is not slowing down. If anything, the pace is getting quicker and quicker all the time. So it's crunch time for learning and development to make sure that we're at the forefront of that. We're staying ahead of that so that we stay relevant and we can align our goals to the business goals. So we need to take a step back. We need to rethink uh, traditional learner journeys that we've been working on, traditional approaches to those. We need to work out how we can enhance learner experience, learner journeys. Uh, and we need to get really close to, to data. What are we measuring? How we analyze that? How do we connect what we're providing as a learning solution to real, genuine business impacts? So that's what we want to talk about today. As I said, I'm here primarily to host because we've got two fine guests with us. First of all, oh sorry, I forgot to say I'm, I'm John. I'll be hosting today. Uh, but we're joined by Matt Donovan, who's our Chief Learning Innovation Officer for GP Strategies. And he'll be focusing on that kind of overall, how we're evolving the design process, how we're evolving the learner journey. And also Bill Conran, Vice President from Watershed, one of our partner companies. And Bill's a real expert on data. Uh, and what Watershed do is amazing in terms of taking all the different feeds from the learning ecosystem, pulling them all together, we can understand what that's telling us and making that great leap from not just what's it telling us to how does that connect to business metrics? How does that connect to business performance? So that's what we're going to talk about. I think you're going to start us off, Matt, with your thoughts on... Yeah, I'll go ahead and get it started. So out of the crunch time concept, we just wanted to bring seven transformational points that we're seeing. So these are seven trends that we're in the midst of that are happening right now. Uh, we're not going to talk about things like, you know, um, blockchain or web 3.0 they're out there coming but these are things we are currently experiencing right now and so just really quickly the first one we're seeing is if you look at on the seven here's the key features and then here's what we're seeing traditionally and here's what we're seeing in the digital or modern learning experience so the first one is, is the primary design point historically has been content and process if you've been a proponent of addy and design and development you know give me the learning objectives give me the content we'll sequence it what we're seeing now is really driving towards learner experience and really going for what's called ruthless relevance. And the idea is trying to put that into every experience that we have. Uh, the next one is really looking at moments of need. And I don't know if you're familiar with uh, five moments of learning need. Uh, Bob Mosher, uh, Conrad Gobertson talk about this. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but historically we think about the first time we're learning something but this range of moments of need really allows us to think about all of those, you know, from the first time you're learning something to when something changes, when something goes wrong. So you're looking at the full system and creating a full journey that we're putting out there. So the measurement approach, historically, we've been much more aligned to uh, training center metrics. Now we're really looking at that connection to the business, starting and going back to how do we take up the most lagging business indicators and create a causal chain all the way up to the key behaviors and then the intervention you're putting in place. So we're definitely gonna talk more about that, but this is an important shift for us. This allows us to help get back to our target audience, what's important for them. The next one is really around learning speed. And this one's about how do we get the solutions out there? The first one is training centric speed of the process. I've got a waterfall process. It's gonna take X amount of time to put it out there. Now you're seeing a lot more around the speed of business using strategies like design thinking, agile design, rapid prototyping to get solutions out there quicker, get feedback on it, evidence-based so you can actually improve them as you're going. The next one is process foundation. Historically, we've been waterfall and systematic, and that doesn't mean that these all go away on the left. We're really expanding them on the right to say, when we don't know what good looks like in highly disrupted times, when we don't know what the good solution is gonna look like, you need a process that's going to help collaboratively with your partners get to what good looks like. If you know what good looks like and you know exactly what to build, use Waterfall, best process to do it. If you don't know what good looks like, is a great process to go down that situation. The last one is, uh, the last two, perspective on learning. 
Historically, we've looked at as learning as discrete elements, things we codify, drop in an LMS, we just track them individually. Now we're seeing holistic integrated systems, really the systems lens at the learning, not just the tech ecosystem, but the whole overall environment around with that. And the last one is really around technology. It was very LMS centric, historically on-prem. Now you're looking at blended technology stacks and all cloud-based. We are gonna kind of cover and hit on some of these topics. I hope you ask questions as we're going through. We may not be able to get through all of them, but if there's one we didn't cover, we'll be around to help kind of dig in and answer questions. But let's jump in and start off with design point. So what I want to show you here is an example of how you might start to think about, uh, from a journey standpoint, trying to teach emotional intelligence. So rather than run, roll out maybe a simple course on it, we start to look at an ecosystem of learning assets that allow me to come in and look at that. Now, some might say, hey, this is blended learning. It is in a way. But what I'm saying is now blended in a digital, and why is this not working? Didn't you hit it for me? There we go, thank you. So now what we're saying is that the blended learning shifts out because now we're talking about flow. So how would my experience start off to allow the learner multiple entry points, multiple exit points, the target user can get what they need, get back to work, come back in and go deeper. So for example, uh, we could start off with emotional intelligence to learn more about it, about, hey, this is what's gonna help you in a future career perhaps or get testimonials from her peers and others about why this is important to the job. She could take uh, the EI, uh, the emotional intelligence self-assessment. She could opt into a chat bot and be able to actually get information pushed to her over time on that topic. She could download uh, the 30 days of emotional intelligence calendar that would drop into her ca calendar, Outlook calendar, for example, and give 30 activities that she could practice emotional intelligence over time. So, and then continues, here's a range of articles. Here's what you could get into uh, deeper classes. There's a MOOC down here, down towards the end. So whether she has five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, or she's got two weeks to do a deep dive, she can go in and find what she wants. The first rule of a modern learning experience is that the learner has accountability for their learning. And this is what's important. That's where the relevance engine really comes from is, when I'm the user, am I getting what I need to answer my questions to do my job better? So our goal is to design this and create space. So the concept of negative space, if, if any of you from the art, it's, it's not just what you put onto the canvas, it's what you don't. And from a design standpoint, we create touch points for that person to step in, own the journey as they're going through that. So this is one of the big design shifts as we look at how we're going through on this. Any Quick questions or, all right, is this gonna work? I don't know, go ahead, were you gonna jump in? Can you pour it, there you go. Right, so, oh, hot mic, got a hot <laughs> mic. Hi everyone, so many of you. Uh, so yeah, th th this idea of, um, uh, uh, of design shift um, has really been prompted or at least is being fulfilled with the ecosystem. And so a lot of what's happening in the ecosystem and in our space where we're looking at measurement is around things like um, how do I look into what's going on across my ecosystem? So in this case, I've got an onboarding program and that program I'm now able to see along that journey, the different prompts, the different um, milestones that I could go in and kind of nudge or prompt if I need to or interact with. And you can see there's like onboarding paperwork complete 80%. Now this is looking at 45 people in a single program I've got 12 completions of that. On average, it's taking 148 days. Like, is that a good thing? I don't know. So you have to, you, you're able to now see what's going on across your ecosystem. And this is exactly uh, in line with the journey that Matt talked about because each of those steps have different data that are coming out of them. So what we're trying to also say is, let's look at that data and make database decisions to go out and interact uh, with where it need be. Yeah, I mean, and it, going with that, it, the more sophisticated the learning journey, the more sophisticated your data collection strategy has to be. So, Bill, you want to talk a little bit about this? Right. This is a sorry about the beer. That was weird. Yeah, this is um, this is kind of an idea of looking at competencies and key performing indicators across the um, a, a, across the organization. So, in other words, we took these um, these scenarios on learner analytics, focusing on the learner 
and the key performance indicators and competencies that are, um, that, that are associated with uh, emotional intelligence. So for instance, communication, retention, adaptability, internal motivation, and then an overall index learning score, which would be kind of a cumulative score across the, uh, the, the, the assessments that have, been, um, that have been assigned. So in this case, um, you, know, you have representation of, of three individuals, and you're able to start seeing where I have somebody who is absolutely excelling at adaptability or the overall learning, um, and then I have two who I could potentially align with those individuals. So these do these lines in the spider graph actually represent individual people. So I can make I could change this spider graph to look at different divisions of an organization, different geographical territories, or the individual. Again, just applying some data and some analytics to my system, my program that I've already created. So, uh, so this is one that's kind of packed in here, but the reason that we put these three together is this is about bringing the human into the digital experience. So I talked about the five moments of learning need over here. And what I love about this, it's a very learner centric model. The base premise is, is that there are five times when somebody needs to learn something, five, five conditions. When you're learning something for the first time, when you learn more, when I, the moment I'm first applying it or getting better at it, when I'm adjusting to change or something has gone wrong. This is when you start to design your learning journey, you wanna be able to meet your learning across all those evolutions to be able to do that. What's really brilliant here is that each of these requires a slightly different approach to teach it. When you're learning for the first time, you may need a lot more scaffolding, a lot more context. But when I'm actually trying to react to something that went wrong, I don't need all that background. I need smaller pieces to be able to do that. And remember when I said that basically the learners have to come into being able to take ownership of that learning journey. That's also not externally when the first five moments, but when you want to become an innovation or growing for your next role, I need something different. That's where they start to step in and look for other things they're having. So you want to be able to design for all of these moments of learning need, have the resources available in your ecosystem. Now, we're changing the roles. So historically, the organization would put it out there, they would consume. Now we're saying the learners are actually taking on these other roles. No longer are they just consuming learning, they're moderating, curating, contributing, creating, collaborating. And especially when you look at moments three, four, and five, this becomes your performance community. These are the ones that are gonna help us get better at our jobs. The, the, when the, social, the learning population is gonna help feed itself. They're gonna help us find solutions out here. This is where you need to really look at an ecosystem of not just teaching for the first moment, but across the entire process so they actually pull into the organization. Now the last one is, is as we support them, what are the types of roles that we have that are enabling? The human roles in the system that we wanna look at. And if you're familiar, this is drawn from uh, Rob Cross's work in organizational network analysis, which really studies how does work get done in organizations. But really learning connectors. This is somebody, and I'm sure everybody has it. So remember the last time you tried to learn something, you had somebody you called. Everybody's got somebody when they need to figure somebody out, they call. That's your learning connector. That's your human to help you find what it is, a trusted resource. And occasionally you need somebody outside of your unit to help you look at across the organization or in other areas. Who can help me find something outside of where I'm at? Those are your learning bridgers. The humans that can help make connections across an organization, cross-functional information. Specialists are the ones that we think about really targeted coaching, targeted mentoring, helping me get better. And then the last ones are the information brokers that are bringing information with the learning to help drive performance in the workplace. So what you really need to look at is as you're defining and building your learning ecosystem, you wanna make sure that you've actually expanded for the different roles, bring them in, find ways to them, engage in the learning, but also you wanna make sure you have these folks inside of an organization. These roles don't show up on an org chart. And as businesses contract as they will, sometimes you will lose these people in an organization. And when you go back to grow, they're not there. It is really hard to really grow and transform. These folks are the connective tissue in an organization. So your role is to uncover, nurture, reinforce, and grow them to be able to do it. These are the humans driving the digital space. 
So I know there's a lot in here, but it kind of really changes it from a very org-centric push model to a much more system that allows everybody to kind of connect and pull their weight. Questions, thoughts? I'll even take pushback. You can tell me I'm wrong too. I'm all right with that as well. Matt, Our, oh yeah. Just a quick question. Yeah. Do you have any best practice or ideas about how you find these people? How do how I you, find these how people? How you go and seek these people? I ask. So one of the things I'll ask somebody, I said, Bill, when's something that you wanted to learn the last time you didn't know how to do? Who did you talk to? Yeah, and I listened to the names. And I just ask, I said, but I'm asking them, when you're trying to make connections around the organizations, who do you call? This is about finding the humans in the system, simply asking. One of the most powerful tools is a human question. <laughs> oh, sorry, I just wanted to say that um, on that slide that I showed with the different competencies, yeah. it's the same idea. You have to ask the, the heads of that business division, what are the key performance indicators and the competencies that we can help you drive? And then if you're able to start seeing those, I, I just find so often that L&D doesn't have visibility into that. And so you're tasked with doing something and yet you have no idea if it's actually working. And I just find it to be a little absurd. And, and that's, that's the point is you want to drive evidence-based decisions, not only after you've launched it, but before you've done that. Bringing in data so you have high confidence it's going to work, bringing that, so collecting that data early is critical. You don't wait until you've launched it and then figure out does it work or not, which actually brings us to the design thinking process. And so I'm sure many of you have probably heard of this, but this again is a process that helps us get to what does good look like when we don't know what it looks like collaboratively. So we start off, most important is we start off with the who. Who are we building for? Do we really know them? Do we know how they feel, think? What are they gonna gain out of it? Why do they even care? Before I start a course, I'm like, will they even care? Do they need to know this? Why is it gonna be relevant to them? Know who you're actually working with. And this is more than a traditional learner analysis. This is going deeper into the emotional components. Then define, what are we solving for them? What problem? What are we really gonna address for them? And then we go into the ideation phase, which is trying to come up with great ideas on how we solve a problem for this particular audience. So this process is meant to really refine because what you're trying to get to is the most elegant solution possible. We're not about it for complexity. We're trying to be laser targeted on what's going to be most relevant for them. And then prototype and test. You want to go out and try something as quickly as possible. You're going to get data and feedback. That data is going to help you improve your solution before you launch it. And then even after, you'll still collect that data. So when we're talking about having that data collection system, you want to put it in that supports your design process as well as your post design. So this is one of the concepts we talk about an MVP. How many of you have heard of a minimum viable product? Can I see a show of hands? All right, good number of you, excellent. So if you've ever been in an experience and does this resonate with anybody? So this is what instructional designers started off with. We're going to build a car. We build a car with one wheel, two wheels. Then we do this because we know we're going to build a car, right? That's how traditional design has gone out. Well, this one says, we're gonna start off with the question, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to move people from point A to point B. How can I do that? The minimum viable product of being able to move here could be a skateboard. So then we go out, I build a skateboard, we test it out. Users come back and said, it's great, I wanna go faster and I want more control. We take the data, we go back, we come back with a scooter. We ask him, hey, I want to go uh, a little faster and I want to carry stuff with me. All right, so we go back, we redesign, but all you're capturing data along here. But here's the thing. We come back to them and they said, actually, we're really happy with the bicycle. Here's the beautiful part. We stop here. We don't build the car if they don't need the car. We only build the bicycle. Now, a year from now, they go, I really want to carry stuff inside and I'm tired of getting wet when it rains. Can you give me something with a roof? Great, we can work on that. But the, the idea here is that minimum viable product for what we do. So again, it's trying to get back to the simplest solution that we're putting out there. So the next section I really kind of want to talk about is learning technology and measurement. And I know this is really complex looking and scary. It's like this, people ask me, can you make this simpler? I said, but it would fail the point. The point is, you go back 10 years, this was a lot simpler. It was a big fat LMS, a couple other things. That's all that was over here. But today, 
you have so many more pieces that you have. So just real quick uh, on this one. So if you look at the left, you're looking at the utility. So what is an organizational's intent? That So first line is, you gotta have a place where they go to get their learning. Where will the learners go? I need to learn something, I need to figure something out, where do I go? First layer, figure out your point. What's it gonna be in? It could be a curated platform, it could be a learning portal, it could be an LMS or an LRS. So you have, but figure out where your point is gonna be. You want your device and interaction layer, you want this to be portable across a range of devices. You want anything you can build to actually work across, you know, seamlessly. Like when I'm watching my Netflix, I go from my phone to my big TV, back to my tablet. I'm able to kind of move across it seamlessly. That's what you want to do. Measurement and analytics is absolutely critical. We've got the basic learning elements over here, but you want to bring in new elements that you're going to do, but you're going to bring it into how am I going to actually draw insights from the data that I'm collecting. So all these other pieces here have data points and you want to be able to bring them in and analyze them as you're going. So that measurement layer is absolutely critical. Intentionality around this is fundamental. Next layer is your experience layer. Tons of things in the experience space around here. This is your learning paths, your MOOCs, all that stuff. This is how you social immersive space, micro, gamified, that's in there. Below the line, this is how the organization actually starts to control its content. How do I use it? How do I reuse it? How do I track it? All of that. So you've got developing, authoring, serving it up, bandwidth friendly, digital asset managers, because we build a bunch of stuff. How do I know I've got the latest? Managing my documents, curation. These are all much more of how organizations need to think about their ecosystem stack, both from a user experience standpoint, as well as internally. What's most important here is this side is getting much bigger. This is actually bullying this side, which is great to see. What I mean is think of things like collaboration workspaces, Slack, Teams, places where we work, things coming into it, we're seeing a lot more connection in this side. So when you're thinking about it, you gotta think about the learning and the workspace. Yeah, and this is just a real world example of one of our customers who um, gave us to us, this is Visa's architecture. Um, and I just always use it because it's really pretty easy to relate to. They've got Degreed on the front end and that could be any LXP or any portal, even a, a, a learning management system. And then right behind you'll see these, you know, pretty typical systems, Cornerstone, MindMarker, LinkedIn, Learning, Pluralsight, like a lot of people have these point systems that you've created. You know, going back to that last slide, when we're looking at modalities, we're looking at like, how are people interacting with this? This is important. If you build this whole thing out, it's quite an investment in time and resources and financially as well. You need to apply analytics to it in order to see what's working and what's not working. And that's a great time to do it, you know, right now, because these systems are existing inside your organization probably already. You inherently have a problem about reporting because they each have their own reports. And so really what we're trying to um, advocate for is this kind of democratization of data. And you'll hear it a million times right now because everyone's saying it. But really, we always push, this is your data. Like, hold on to it. You know, if you want to push it out to Tableau or something after your familiar with it and you can manipulate it and make sure that it's accurate that's great but if you if it's all something that you have to go ask questions of you might not even know which questions you want to ask of the data unless you actually have access to it so by kind of aggregating all of this stuff and making it available to L&D teams you'll be surprised at what instructional designers will find you know anomalies and things like that you'll be surprised at just some of the um, the things you can uncover that you can share within the organization and apply to uh, real world outcomes this is a good example for one. Matt and I uh, have gone kind of back and back forth on this one, but this was an idea of an organization who we work with who launched their ecosystem in 2018. So prior to that, we've got a lot of historic um, LMS data, and then suddenly they launched this ecosystem. The video platform was launched there in 2019. Now, 2019, the, yep. The idea behind this was if we curate our own videos, could we cut back some of the cost from our content platform? And they did. So the videos were wildly adopted there in 2021. And yet, and, and at that same time, the content platform regressed. So that it would be, you know, a library. And so the question they asked was like, you know, do we need to go back and, and uh, talk to that content provider about renegotiating our license? Our usage is not what it was, you know? It, and so it's just with that data, you're able to go back and have those good conversations. 
and, and I'll even push that it may not be a zero sum game. The question is, is there's still a strong use here. What are they using? You may have 8,000 titles, but we're finding that 90% of the titles are in this area. Can I get it more efficiently, more effectively, but balancing out? This is not a zero sum game. It's about thinking about overall, what do you know? What are they consuming? What are they trying to do with it? Data helps drive those insights. So the question is, before you go into this, you have to have a plan. You have to have an idea of how you're actually going to measure. So what this allows us to do, and actually we start over here on the right. So the right is really looking at our strategic goals. These are the most lagging business indicators. And what this represents is a causal chain from the business indicators, the most lagging, all the way up to the beginning, which is some of the behaviors, to the actual investment that we put in place. Here's what I'm saying, is that if you do this and you're pulling actual data real time, I get level three, level four within the natural system as it is. I don't need to go out and do a $100,000 survey to figure out if a $300,000 initiative's working or not, because I'm getting the data downstream. So as you go through, you look at your business results, your leading indicators, and you go back to the initiative that you did. This is probably one of the most important conversations to have with your business partners. And I love it because it starts off with them, asking them, how do you measure your business? How do you know when you're doing well? How do you know to promote? How do you know who have corrective conversations with? How do you collect that data? And then you can map it out like this. This leads to that architecture, collecting the data, then you have the insights and the analysis that goes with it. So just the last thing here, really looking at quickly on just a systemic look at the L&D organization. We have 11 components in here that of an L&D organization, it looks at it as a system. Starting at the top, governance, whether you're centralized, decentralized, how will you govern? What, govern what gets out there? How do we update it? How do we change it? What's your governance? How are you structured? How are you rolling it out? How are you connecting? Are you putting learning folks in the business? Are you having contact points operational? How are you set up to structure your revenue streams? Business partner alignment? Learning, this is where you're gonna talk about your modalities and your approaches. Leadership development, what are you doing specifically for that connection? Tech and innovation go together. So what's your tech strategy look like? But in the space of innovation, how do you get to proactive so that you know a tech's gonna work before you actually decide to launch it? That's where innovation comes in, talent management alignment, and that pie is getting much bigger. And then you got organizational and measurement analytics. But each of these dimensions, when we work with our organizations, we're looking overall, how are you balanced? So let's say I'm gonna add a curation platform to my company, that is a cultural change. That is a pull-based system. You've been push-based, you've got a cultural shift. How do you need to organize your organization to support a pull-based system, a true culture? Change management kind of wraps all the way around this, but these are key components that we look at for a systemic look at it. And of course, we give you one additional resource. You want to learn more about this. This is a, tell them about this. Yeah, this is a, a survey we did of 2,500, 2,300 learning professionals, which I always note in itself is pretty cool that 2,300 learning professionals actually responded to the survey. Uh, but we just put this out maybe two weeks ago. It's called Measuring the Business Impact of Learning. And it really shows a lot around um, these enterprises and how there's a desire to actually apply analytics to the ecosystem um, and beginning to be a push from the top to start getting analytics, which is awesome because for the longest time, L&D has been the one that's like, I don't know, we just push it out there and hopefully people take it. Now we're actually starting to say, hey man, we wanna be on the same table with you know our finance department and our marketing department. And y'all know what I'm talking about. So um, please do, um, we're right there. We have plenty of geeks. If you wanna get started, we can talk all about this stuff all day. It's our favorite thing. Uh, thanks for listening to two beardy Americans. Uh, it's been an honor. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.